Thank you very much for having me here. I'll just make a mention about uh, where, w w the, where I've come from. Um, at Durham University, which is in the northeast of England, we just got a big grant from a charity called the Leverhulme Trust, um, which uh, was uh, founded by the same guy who started the Unilever Corporation. And many of you uh, used deodorant this morning. It was manufactured by the ancestors of this guy. Um, they make all sorts of products. And they gave us a big grant to study all sorts of things to do with why things change so suddenly. And obviously, if you've been watching, watching the news from Madison to Egypt, um, this is a very timely th subject right now. In fact, somebody just came to me a week ago and said, I want to do my PhD on, on um, Tunisia in Egypt and how, wh how, how did that tipping point occur there. So it's a very exciting time um, to be studying such things. But leading up to this, um, I do uh, work in, in, I'm in an anthropology department, um, but, uh, but I, had a, I had some training in the evolution of, uh, of cultural behavior at the University College London. And so I do a bit of um, consulting with marketers and so on. And one of the things that I've that I've worked on for a while is trying to communicate um, different models of how we understand uh, mass behavior to different schools of thought. And a behavioral economist named Herb Gintis, who's very famous in the behavioral economic, economics realm, he points out very simply the simple fact that in the different behavioral sciences, we have totally different models for human decision making in psychology, in anthropology, in, in economics, um, and in sociology. None of these uh, different disciplines shares the same basic model of how human beings make decisions. It's really a problem. Um, and uh, we've, we, we have some, uh, there are some articles out there that, are, that try to unify the behavioral sciences. Um, and this is my attempt here, and I find that this, this uh, kind of quells some of the objections. Uh, but let me just, if, I if, you if you go away from this lecture with anything, um, I would like it to be this, because I, it does, I'm finding it's helping me more and more thinking about things. So um, when we think about, uh, often for, for, for the last 200 years or so, um, a very prominent model of human behavior is the rational actor model. Um, and that's something we might put up, up in the upper left of this diagram. So let me describe first what this diagram shows. It, sho it, it divides um, our consideration of how people make decisions into two kind of dimensions. The first is, are they making the decision on their own, or are they making it in the context of lots of other people? Are they making socially based decisions or independent based decisions? So a lot of experiments you see in, in, um, in uh, experimental psychology might put somebody in a room, um, and they've got potato chips um, and uh, chocolate, and uh, they decide which one they like. And uh, the potato chips, the, their value of potato chips is changed by the presence of, of the chocolate there on the table and so on. Um, but they're doing that isolated. How often do we make decisions in isolated uh, situations? Well, that's up to you to decide. But in many cases, we're making our decisions in a social context, and arguably more so um, in the modern era. But, um, but never have we not made decisions in social context. And here you have various schools of thought here, some of which would call this uh, biased learning or social learning models and so on. And they're different from the rational um, actor model because here we're using others to help us uh, make our decisions as opposed to very, um, uh, very intelligently weighing all the costs and benefits of a potential decision. So that's one dimension there to that uh, diagram. The other dimension though is this one which is how, 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 many, how many things do you have to choose between? So if you have just a few, which are obviously quite different, you can weigh them up and look at them. Even if you're going to copy from someone, you're going to learn to copy, you're going to learn the violin from somebody who knows how to play the violin rather than somebody who doesn't. And that's because you know, um, you, you can look at the person and know or ask them a question or two and know that they, they actually um, have this skill. 
But what happens when we move down here and we have um, many equivalent options? So think about the number of the, the sheer diversity of different uh, soap powders in the in the supermarket, or all the different uh, brands of uh, low quality beer in um, in a in a bottle market, for example. And it, at some point, they all look the same. Um, or if you, were, if you were an amateur investor and you turn to one of page on the Wall Street Journal and you look at all those mutual funds um, or stocks or whatever and they all have those strange acronyms, they're, they're just all over the place and you might just take a guess. So you, you might be looking at the newspaper independently, but um, there are so many different options and you have so little information about them. Um, Price plans on, mo on uh, cell phones, for example, features. There's so many aspects where we're just overwhelmed with choice these days. You might just point at something and take it. Here, though, um, the other option you might do is um, say, uh, I'll have what she's having. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll just do what he's doing. Um, what, what, uh, uh, what are you getting? OK, I'll get that too. And so here, we've got actually a, an instance where you're, you're copying someone else, but you're not making an intelligent decision about it. You're just saying, I'll do what he's doing. Um, and in any panic situation or crowd situation, people are doing this. But also, it appears that in many consumer situations, people are doing this. And a great example of this is the way that, I think, the way that we pick up slang words. Uh, you probably all thought that you've used an original slang word only to find that somebody else is using it, or, or even you might even see it on TV. So you pick that up subconsciously, and you started using a word subconsciously, and it would be very, very difficult to track down uh, the person you copied that from. So. Um, the one, the one thing that I think that is quite useful about dividing up decision-making processes in this way is that each corner of this diagram has a different ex expectation for the patterns you would see and also how you would take action. So I worked on a, um, I worked on a project for uh, the Department of Health in, in the UK, in Britain, and they were interested in, well, how do we get, um, how do we get people to practice better um, sexual, sexual health decisions? And they were essentially thinking, well, are people making rational uh, action, are they making rational cost-benefit decisions about whether to get a chlamydia test, for example, and go in and get one? Not really, was what the data showed. Um, if they were, then uh, probably you wouldn't have much of a problem. But basically, they were doing what um, people were making choices that were very much affected by others around them. And that affected how you approach the problem. Because if it's a rational cost-benefit decision, you can just put up information. Chlamydia has this risk. Uh, you're at risk if you do this. You can just put that on the subway, and people will see that and know that they're supposed to go in and, and, or not and do it. But um, as, a, as, a matter of, uh, as a matter of how the procedure went, we found we, we advised them that no, that's actually not the case for a lot of people. And instead, what the Department of Health did was actually invest in putting sexual health clinics in a visible location so that people could see that they were part of the community and essentially think, well, people are going in there. It's visible. It's respectable. I'll go in there. Much different strategy based on a, on a quantitative, qualitative uh, distinction in how people are making decisions. So what I'm going to do in this talk is just go through a little bit of description about these different areas of this uh, four box, which I hope you'll um, accept to some degree, uh, and, uh, and then show you a few examples if there's time. Uh, so here in the Northwest, I won't say a lot about this one because this is rational choice theory. A few different choices that you're making, you're making them independently, and you're weighing, you've got the time and the intelligence and the, and the information to make a, a rational decision ab about, about what to do. Um, one of the things that, uh, that you can expect from looking at change through time so like I said, each one of these corners of this diagram has a different pattern that we expect. And one of the things that, um, that you would expect up here is if, if someone builds a better mouse trap or if there's a 75% off sale on something, people just go. They don't have to hear it from somewhere else. It doesn't have to diffuse through the population. They just do it. And um, I've always been interested in the popularity of baby names, or I have been for about 10 years now. And most baby names don't fit in this um, realm, but the ones that do, are the, are the very few celebrity names over the, over the century. These are, this is data from the Social Security Administration. And you get presidents who will boost the popularity of a name um, 
extremely and very quickly. So a typical pattern um, through time that you would see through this, and there are now all sorts of tools that allow us to see these things just in an instant. Uh, Google n-grams, for example, just, just un, um, unveiled in December, where you can see the popularity of, a, of words in 4% of all books since the 1700s. Fantastic um, new tool. Um, but here you can see the, the typical pattern is for um, a, 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 a sharp increase on the left side and then a sort of concave up decrease on the, on the right side. So these famous presidents here um, boosted their names accordingly. And it's very difficult actually to find a celebrity effect that's very uh, significant. Elvis had one. Britney caused a, a boost after her 1998 album, but then this name was on its way out anyway, and it just continued down the same trajectory. All she could do was boost it for um, just a, a few years, and then it was on its way down again. But that's, that's one pattern you would expect from the upper left there. I'm going to talk a lot more about things on this side in this talk. So here we have um, a phenomena where uh, things are, are socially learned, but they're also, you also have the in information about the person that you're learning from. So uh, we all come from hunter and gathering societies in, our, in, in ancient uh, prehistory. And in a hunting group, uh, males would always know who's the best hunter. They've seen him have success. They know that he's the best hunter. Similarly, if you play sports, you know who the best player is and so on. And you choose to copy that person because you can make it and learn from that person because you can make an intelligent decision that that person is the best to learn from because he or she is the most skilled. And um, we expect that, uh, that we actually have quite a, a developed ability to do this because we are a social species. Robin Dunbar at Oxford um, has, um, has argued for, for a couple of decades now that the evolution of the brain itself, um, particularly the neocortex, is, um, is really for the purpose of managing and, 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 and uh, navigating complex social uh, relationships within our species. Uh, but it's also true to some extent in, in other primates as well. But so, you know, the reason why we obsess so much over romantic relationships and relationships in general, it seems like such a waste of time. But actually, our brain has evolved um, to do that. Um, and now recently, people have actually been extolling the benefits of copying. Uh, copying has is, is long been a business strategy. McDonald's copied its model from White Castle. McDonald's has been a copier par excellence for its whole uh, period as a, as a corporation. A copy from Burger King, a copy from White, Co White Castle, and it improved on um, the recipes of either. And the, the, and the reason why it was so sex, su successful is because they let the others do the work and take all the risks and then they copy. This turned out to be uh, the winner, a copying strategy in a recent paper in Science. Um, I don't know if Stefano has uh, mentioned this, but, co but uh, and sorry for the cutoff the, of the slide, but copying was the winning strategy in, um, in this group, Stefano's group, um, t the tournament that they held. And not only was it copying, but it was copying with a very short memory. Um, a, 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 a computer algor algorithm called Discount Machine won, won that tournament. Um, others, others, many others have not only recognized our ability to copy as humans, but also, um, also the benefits of doing so. Um, over, over even our evolutionary history. And in the background here, I show a school of fish simply to remind you that, uh, that the appearance of coherent behavior, you see a school of fish actually going in a, a, a very uh, elegant spiral pattern, does not require any outside design. So fish, mo the, the fish in that school are just copying their, their nearest neighbors, generally speaking. And the only thing you need to introduce some coherence to that movement is just put in something um, uh, Jens Krauss at, uh, at, uh, at a British university calls it a robofish. You just need some consistency of movement. And others copying each other will eventually, that, that introduces a movement to the whole school. But it's not like they're following the leader. They're following each other. And there's, there's a leader within them, or there's somebody with a, with a momentum within them. But you don't actually have to have everybody um, f following that uh, leader in particular. So there are many instances where it might seem like people are doing things uh, independently or based on co cost benefit decisions, and they may very well not be. Here's an example of a, of a, of a great paper by Joe Henrik and others 
uh, many others, anthropologists, who went to different societies and asked them to play the ultimatum game, which is you put $100 on the table and say to two people on either side of the table, say to one, just give as much of this uh, $100 as you'd like to the person on the other side, um, and he or she can reject it if they think it's, uh, if they think it's too little. Um, and um, in Pittsburgh, uh, undergraduate po populations, the average offer is 50% of the, of the pie. But in a very cooperative society like the La Mulera whale, uh, whale hunting so society in Indonesia, which is predicated on the benefits of cooperation, everybody has to do their bit in a whale hunt or the whale hunt uh, fails as an endeavor for everyone, you see a much greater uh, cultural norm about how much of that uh, pie to give. In fact, most people in the, ultimate, in the ultimatum game will actually give substantially more than 50%, some even as much as 90%. A very cooperative society. Conversely, the Hadza hunter-gatherers, which are based on, on isolated family units, um, which don't require a great deal of cooperation with a large kin group, they, they're quite uh, meager in terms of the amounts they'll, they'll give, and also uh, their contemporaries will, will accept a, a quite a low offer, the kind that would be rejected in a cooperative society like this. So there are norms of, um, of, of, uh, of fairness, something that some, some of us think is a human universal, but it's communicated to people through um, reasoned copying. This is what we do in this society, so therefore I will do it. Um, one approach now to, to dealing with uh, this, this social spread of behaviors is the network approach. Here's, uh, here's uh, Nicholas uh, Christakis and, Donald, and, and James Fowler's uh, map of obesity in a, in a New England uh, um, a, a, a New England uh, community, and these are it's it, by mapping out not um, not always why people become obese in terms of their own reasons, but simply mapping out the people to which they're um, befriended or their kin. They find that actually you're about two thirds as likely to be obese if simply your friend is obese. And that was a major revelation that made New England Journal of Medicine just a, just a few years ago. The simple fact that something that we so often thought was a cost benefit kind of behavior is actually partly social. Okay, so. There are all these now, there's all these re revelations about behavior X is socially spread, behavior Y is socially spread, and so on. Um, and how are we going to work with these? Uh, well, network approaches is one thing, but networks are static, and it's as if we're all, they're very useful, um, but sometimes we get over-focused on this network idea because we live online and, we, and people live on Facebook and also because we tend, to, we tend to like these models where people, it's as if people are connected by wires to each other and tubes. But think about all the interactions you have today that you won't have probably again for, for a long time or just maybe never again. Um, and the ephemeral nature of, of your interactions and you think that actually we're not really connected in that, in that uh, static way, are we? Uh, and so models, dynamic models of social influence have been around for a long time and uh, quite, uh, if, this is Frank Bass who, invent, who uh, proposed this model for, for marketers, uh, commercial marketers in 1969. It's just a standard of marketing, um, marketing approaches to consumer behavior. And um, he basically proposed that uh, we have a a spectrum of behavior which corresponds to the top of the, the, the east-west axis of this four box here. And he said if people are choosing things independently, then the adoption curve will be like this. It'll spike up and then decay like this, just like those president curves I showed you. And something that is fashionable will do this, a symmetric um, curve of, of adoption. And uh, since then, a lot of people have showed how the adoption of, uh, of new washing machines have done this, new technologies, and so on. Many, many things have this show this pattern of popularity, rise to popularity and then um, tail off. So we have existing models already from, from the 60s even to do a rudimentary differentiation between this side and that side. And you can get data that conform to this because all you need is popularity through time. Even archaeologists have uh, data on popularity through time. They count the number of times they see a certain pottery design through the, through the ages um, and, uh, and they wind up with these sorts of curves all the time. Anything to do with fashion also has this uh, kind of thing. And now you can 
you can just at the touch of a button look at the popularity of a certain topic on Twitter. So do you all remember Touchdown Jesus from last year? Does anyone here remember that? There's a Jesus statue in Ohio, um, a massive one you can see to the left, which was struck by lightning and just obliterated, um, burnt to a crisp in an instant. And there was a lot of chatter about that. Um, and there, it inspired some tourism. But you can see when the, the, literally the lightning event occurred, you see this spike in Twitter activity about touchdown Jesus, just searching for the, the, the phrase touchdown Jesus. Then people go to bed, but then in the morning, you see actually that the buzz around Touchdown Jesus is a different shape. It's more of that social shape here. You can see it's kind of symmetric. It's not perfect. You know, a lot of times it's better to smooth these curves out. But that's a pattern for a lot of things. An event happens, you've seen a political speech happen. It happens, you're like, oh, that was a pretty good speech or something, you know. And then you see all the spin and everything changes. Um, and people, uh, people are passing um, information back and forth about that event. Um, but that's a, that's a nice demonstration how the two things can happen actually um, following one event. Uh, it's, now, you know, it's now becoming increasingly po possible to monitor all sorts of data. And even now, now you can actually get information about this kind of thing, but actually resolved as to where the person was in space. Because people are uh, logging on to Twitter. On, if they're logging on on an iPhone, then oftentimes you get a spatial coordinate for that. And it's fascinating potential to look at the difference of response to events um, by neighborhood, for example. You might even be able to resolve it by different neighborhoods in New York City, for example. OK, so that's just a little exploration of the upper left here, where we had social decisions, but where people could actually um, respond uh, to each other or to their, their uh, friends or people that they know something about. Um, or may, maybe they're following a, a, a cultural norm. But what happens when we all those things that we encounter out there um, in the commercial world, uh, particularly online, where people are using all sorts of new phrases and trying to get you to look at this, look at that. We're, so we're, in, a, in other words, we're confronted with many similar choices, but it's also an intensely social environment. Here is where we lose our ability to keep track. What, do, you know, do I go with price plan A or price plan Q? Do I, uh, do I take this soap powder or the soap powder number 223? What kind of slang do I use? And so on. Lots and lots of very similar choices where the decision is not life or death, um, and it's not even really costly. So I was in Denver last year um, with, um, that's um, my baby boy who's now uh, 16 months instead of six. And we go to an REI store, and there was a whole wall of insulated coffee mugs. Like, I, I just, I, I'd made the decision to get one that was insulated. But um, I wasn't sure, you know, do, what color, what design, um, the plastic construction, all these things. Um, and if there'd been someone there choosing one at the moment, I would have just said, I'll just do what he's doing. I'll have that. <laughs> Similarly, a lot of people work on the evolution of attractiveness. What, you know, is it facial symmetry that makes a woman attractive to a man? Is it the movement? Is it the hourglass figure? There, there are stacks and stacks of paper about, papers about this. Um, and, they, and they have a lot to them. But we've never been in a situation where we could look at all of these very well-groomed and, and uh, very handsome faces of human beings and, and try to choose a mate from that. Um, in 40,000 BC, it was either Ugg or Zug, and they were both ugly, and they both had bad, bad breath. And you probably had no choice in the matter anyway, because either you were, you were socially pressured to, to, to marry somebody, or you just you mate, or you don't, uh, re, you know, you don't uh, reproduce. And here, um, you, there, there are thousands of people out there that would make quite a good mate for you. Um, and they're all out there for you to choose from. So how do you decide? So we are overwhelmed with choices. A wonderful paper about this, um, this effect and what happens when we're overwhelmed with choices and allowed and put in a social environment in which to choose them was done by Duncan Watts and Matt Salganik. Matt Salganik is, was Watts' student. Um, and he's now um, in Princeton, uh, I, th I believe, in the sociology department. And they simply let, uh, let people download music in two situations. In one case, they downloaded music um, and they explored a music download list on their own. 
And in the other case, they did it where they could see what others were downloading. There was some information about the popularity of the music. And they uh, won't get into the results of the paper too much, but they had a measure for how predictable the eventual outcome of that process was in terms of what would become the most popular. And the social situation was vastly more unpredictable than the independent case. So you would rerun the experiment in the social case, um, and you would just get a different winner. You rerun it again, you get a different winner. So they argued, and still do, that social interaction in the presence of a, of a very large uh, amount of choice is fundamentally unpredictable. You, it, it depends on chance little uh, differences in the beginning process. That snowballs, and you, don't, you can't predict where it's going to go. Here are a lot of guys who have worked on models of, how, of choosing things where we, um, where we have many options to choose from and we essentially say, I'll have what she's having. Uh, there's Andrew Ehrenberg uh, who founded a, a, um, a great uh, center for marketing science. It's amazing how much rich and, uh, and empirical science has been done in marketing about these kinds of things that everybody's interested in now because marketers, are, of course, are interested in uh, mass behavior. Here's one of the greatest social scientists of the 20th century, Herbert Simon. He published a few uh, models that very much like this. And uh, um, Martin Nowak up at, uh, up at Harvard, Harvard as well. Um, worked on models like this. And now I'll just give you a few empirical patterns that are, that are delivered by this model. I'm not going to go into the details of how the, the model essentially says um, that we have a population of individuals who are more or less just saying, I'll have what, what she's having. I'll do what she's doing. And we're all doing that. And occasionally, about 5% of the time, somebody does something original. And that brings in new things into this um, mass economy. 5% uh, innovators. That, that rule of thumb figure, that's very similar to, let's say, a marketing kind of rule of thumb, that there, there are 2 to 5% innovators out there who are truly doing something novel. The rest are copying at different stages. Uh, one of the things that this, that this does, though, when you loosen it up like this and you just say, a, a very small proportion of innovators, a lot of people just copying at, at uh, virtually at random, just saying, I'll have what she's having. You generate um, a long tail distribution of, um, of popularity. All of you have seen this when you've looked at the Amazon.com Amazon sales rankings. Um, they form a very nice long tail distribution where the first one, the number one book, or number two, number one and maybe number two outsell almost all the other, um, all the other copies combined. And that was popularized by uh, Chris Anderson. This model delivers that. Um, it also delivers that distribution in, uh, and, and allows it to undergo constant turnover. So it's not only just, this is one of the, the um, if, if you follow the literature on this kind of stuff, a lot of, there's a lot of models that can produce this Amazon.com long tail distribution, but they're usually just fixed like that, and the winner just keeps getting richer, and the losers keep, getting, keep falling further behind. But in this case, if you just, and Stefano uh, uh, models something very similar to this process. In this case, you get, um, you get this, this shape of the distribution, but, but what it constitutes it is changing all the time. So number one is changing even uh, over time. And uh, you can look at different distributions of different things and, and map this model to those distributions. This doesn't prove that this model works for all these different phenomena. It's just a one of the conditions that you'd require to, to match the model to the data. But those are various data, um, data that you can get online. And we just use, put, plug different parameters into this, this random copying model, or neutral model, as it's also called. But I, I like to call it the random copying model. Um, and, and we're able to replicate all these different long tail distributions, how popular websites are, how popular English words are, baby names, um, even academic citations. Um, there's a lot of uh, evidence now that we do a lot of copying of citations. It also replicates the lifespans, um, patterns of lifespans in the top 10. So something, some things like, um, you, you all are too young, but there was the, the, the um, 
the album Dark Side of the Moon uh, was in the, in the top uh, 200 for years and years, starting from the 70s, obviously, but even into, even into my uh, adolescence, it was still there. Um, and you do get that with this model. You get the occasional um, element, you get the occasional thing, which just by luck, uh, winds up staying within the top five or top 40 for a long time, and most spend a short time within that. Uh, within that. And um, finally, if you look at things through time, not all things do this, um, but this is the pattern you get from this random copying model. Things go up and they go down and they willy-nilly, but sometimes, and this is just through luck, sometimes something will get very popular and then decline like that. Those, that's actually running the model for a few different, um, and, and watching how different uh, so-called choices they're just, they're just abstract. They could be, you know, blue, ye yellow shirts, green shirts, blue shirts, whatever you want to be modeling. But things through time go up and down like that. A lot of patterns of popularity look like this. If you look at the Lycos top 50, Lycos is an old search engine, but if you look at, you can look at this on Google Trends, for example, and you can search a lot of things. Um, and their popularities through time, topics, um, celebrities, how often people are searching for certain names, and so on. You'll see things, uh, you do see this, this, tent, this type of pattern. And the important thing to remember here is even just, um, as, um, just, just as a thought experiment, it makes you realize that something like this does not need a reason to become immensely popular. It just, there will always be something under this process that becomes immensely popular. Stefano is doing more work on, on this versus a model that's in, that, uh, that uh, where he's uh, improved on it in some way or at least um, applicable to different phenomena. But this is, he showed, he and uh, Alberto Acerbi and, and uh, Magnus Enquist uh, show a nice example of lots of these traits um, being randomly copied. They go up and down in popularity. Um, and it's very messy. But I've looked at a lot of commercial data sets now from, from marketers, the sales of, of various things, the sales of deodorants, the sales of music through Sony um, and, uh, or, and, and, and other companies like that. And you'll see, you'll see a lot of things look like this. Alex, yeah, sorry. Can you just uh, explain stochastic things more? I'm not sure that I got Oh, yeah, stochastic means that um, the the popularity of something, which is this popular now, only depends on where it is there. So it just goes up or down from there. There's no, it doesn't have to be a, a, a coherent momentum to it. It just, you just look at today and you say, well, it could go up or down from today. But if it gets a string of luck, there it goes. Yeah, weak. Yeah, weak would be all right. Or, or, um, or um, chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this red one just got a series of um, series of lucky breaks, and we, as thinkers, we often look at the winner of a process and ascribe a reason. But if you hold a lottery, there's always going to be a winner in a lottery. Right? So, and there's no reason why the lottery winner won. It's just because we focus on that one, one individual. Okay. So I'm just going to look very quickly at a few, uh, few examples here. George Orwell in 1946 in the magazine Horizon wrote a book, an essay called um, Academics in the English Language, or, or Politics in the English Language. Sorry, I'm thinking about academics. Where he asserted that people, that politicians just copy long strips of words from each other. This is not a new idea about copying. Just that's meant to show you that. Um, and there are a couple other uh, examples I'd like to show you, including one from Bird Songs. So here's a colleague at University of Mass Amherst, Bruce, Am uh, Bruce Byers, who works in the uh, biology department. And for 20 years, he's been recording the songs of chested uh, breasted uh, warblers in the Berkshire uh, Mountains of Massachusetts. Oh, was there a? Ch yes, sorry. What did I call them? Chest breasted, sided. Well, they're birds. Um, <laughs> no, they are warblers. But I, I and I wanted to show Bruce here because what I did was was trip, was very small compared to what he's done, which is all these recordings of bird songs over time. They digitize the voice. 
here, and they recognize, they, they see, they, re, they break it down into elements that they can then say, um, bird A, these two birds were actually singing the same notes or same elements of their songs. And um, he, f he found over the long term, over 20, uh, 10, 15 years, almost 20 years by the time he was done, um, that um, things just came and went in some of these songs, just like, just, it seemed just like fashion. But then there was another brand of, um, of, of songs where actually that was not the case. Um, things were sticking around. And uh, just to make a long story short, for one of those, for the songs, the, the elements of the songs, think of, think of the, the elements as like words in a sentence or letters in a word. They're elements that, that when you combine them make, make a complete uh, song. Uh, those, to make a long story short, those actually fit the random copying model. Um, uh, they fit it quite well in terms of this, the, the long tail distribution, but which had totally different elements within it from 1989 to 2007. The distribution of popularity looks the same, but in 1989, the elements were quite different than in 2007, just like it would be for a uh, human pop chart. But the songs that were, that were, and also there was a great deal of variation um, and change over time in those competition songs. But on those songs that were actually used for mating, that the males would sing to the females, there was virtually no change over time, over 20 years. And so what, um, and, and so we essentially showed this through applying this model, and then Bruce, uh, who knows these birds well and is, uh, and is a, um, a biologist, uh, was able to conclude that, that actually these songs were under drift, just like fashionable music today. Um, that males were copying each other, um, and it didn't really matter so much what they were singing. They were just they just needed to be singing something that was relatively current, and um, and they were and they were copying these elements. But here, the, the the females were actually picking out something in the songs of males that they liked, that they were using to judge the fitness of the mates. And so, because these songs were under selection, and if, and effectively. These courtship songs would be the upper would be um, would, would would be some sort of rational choice on the female perspective, never changed, and they did not conform to that random copying model. So the male-male competition uh, were consistent with that model. The courtship um, songs were falsified the random copying model, and so that actually gave him gave interesting insight into the the uh, biology of these birds and how these songs were used. Another one though is um, academic buzzwords. And uh, it's amazing how much, how much literature an academic is now responsible for. I have a friend who works in the field of HIV research, and there are 110,000 uh, journal articles that relate to his subject. It's not possible to read all those. Um, and uh, one of the things we do as academics is uh, we learn from other people what's important to know. And in there, there are two realms of, I, I took two realms of, uh, uh, of academic science. One was in physics, I want to just say it's in physics, and one was in social sciences to do with the subject of social capital, social capital. Um, and again, here to just distill this study down, what I was trying to do is see, is there a difference in the physical science literature, this niche of physical science, versus this niche of social science. And um, I concluded from trying to, matching these patterns to the different, these, the data on the keyword frequency within these different disciplines, where you, which you can now get. How often are they using different words in their abstracts and titles and so on? The physicists would, um, they started off, uh, the, the turnover in their top five words that they used. There was a bit of turnover in the opening years of this, uh, of, this, of, of this paradigm. But then after time, there was no turnover. Word number one was ner word number one. Word number two was word number two, and it just stayed there. But in the social sciences, we also got these long tail distributions for both of these, which is just showing you that that's not sufficient to really to differentiate everything. Um, but in this case, 
you had this long tail distribution and constant turnover. New words coming into the top five most popular all the time, um, just continually over, 20, over um, almost 20 years now. New words, um, uh, so, e even though it's the, the whole discipline is predicated on a couple of buzzwords, you still get constant refreshment of the top five um, most popular buzzwords in association with this discipline. So that suggested that this, the social sciences, at least their use of vocabulary, was down here, whereas the, the, the physical sciences, they were definitely learning, from, learning it from each other, but once they decided what their vocabulary was, they stuck with it. Um, and just to show you how the, the, the patterns through time, how things change through time. It's actually, you can just do pattern recognition on this stuff. You can see how the popularity of the words in the, the top five words in physics, in this particular physics niche, eventually, they go up and down, but they pretty much order themselves. Number one is number one, number two is number two. So a little bit of back and forth between these two, but more or less, the popularity of these things is, is parallel. Whereas here in the social science case, they're just going up and down and crossing each other and coming in and out of popularity and so on. So that's, that's stochastic and that's smoother. That's something where we expect there's some sort of selection of words going on. And I'll just give you finally um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of points about baby names. This was our first study of, of using this model down in the lower right. The distribution fit the popularity. The distribution fit the lifespans of baby names in their um, how long they stay in the top five. Um, and once, once you put stuff into the model, what you get out is actually a parameter that describes how innovative are people being with these baby names. It's just one of the two parameters that goes into the model to match the data. And so then it comes out and you can actually plot the, um, the, the, the invention rate of boys' names over time, which is about 2% per decade. Uh, per year, sorry, an invention rate of girls' names, which is about 4%, peaked in the 70s because that was the, the end of the, uh, um, that was just before that infamous uh, Rolling Stones concert when the 60s ended. But uh, before then, people were being incredibly inventive with their names. And one thing I still have no um, explanation for is why <laughs> the invention rate was so flat. It's natural that it would be, we're more inventive with girls' names than with boys' names in the patriarchal society that USA more or less is on a population scale. But in 1998, both the inventiveness on both, for both boys and girls just shot up um, right from there. And when I first saw this, I thought, oh, it's the internet. But it's not the internet because that's 1988. Um, and furthermore, there might be some time delay because we're looking at the top 1,000 baby names and it actually takes a while um, to get up into the top 10. But if any of you have any idea why, why US culture has become so much more creative with baby names in the last uh, 30 years, please let me know. Because I have no idea why that happened. It's a very fascinating transition. Have you looked at the immigration factor? At the what? Immigration. Uh, yeah, well, Jose is the, per, currently the most popular name in Texas, but uh, for obvious reasons. But um, but yeah, we, we we took the and and actually this this map will demonstrate that. The hotter colors here show the higher invention rates. These are girls' names. These are boys' names. So the yellows and oranges are very high um, invention rates. Look at how much colder all the states are in the 60s, um, and particularly here in the Northeast. Uh, people very traditional in their choice of boys' names, a little bit more inventive with girls' names. But generally, there was a, an east to west gradient, more inventive to the west. But by 2009, we're very inventive almost across the country, still a bit more conservative here in the northeast, especially North N New England. But what we did actually was compare these uh, inferred invention rates to the migration figures for those states. And there was no correlation. So that's some evidence that it's not related to, we could, there, it was just, uh, there was just a scatter of points. There was no correlation between migration rate and the inventiveness of, of names. Um, so it suggests that it's actually something different. It's something cultural that, um, that people do tend to be a bit more conservative here in the Northeast. But all of us as, um, in the United States are uh, much more inventive. And this is, why does, why does this matter? Because uh, if people are more inventive, 
um, and they're, they're also copying each other around them. What can happen is actually quite discrete differences can evolve out of that process, even though it's not actually um, pre, uh, designed that way. So if, if, you tend, if there's a little bit of invention in your community or your state, and you're also, there's also that, um, sim that, that the main thing going on is people copying those around them. Um, you can actually have a situation where this kind of invention and copying actually causes different cells of, of community to just uh, drift apart. And if you look at the 1960s here, great homogeneity and the top, the most popular name by state. Uh, Mary was popular almost throughout the country. You had also had different names like Susan and Laurie and Julie. Um, but in, in most of these names were there near the top five anyway. And here's the boys' top five, David, James, Michael, John, and Robert. And James here, David west of the Mississippi, John, uh, John and Michael here in the Northeast. But in any given state, those were the top five names. It just, made, it just got shuffled uh, which one was number one, and that's all I'm showing in that map. Now, you have a much greater montage, uh, so you, much, you have much, more, much greater differences between states that are even neighboring. And what's amazing, too, is not only um, do we have many more names now which are number one for a given state, with the exception of the South and parts of the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic, but you also have the case where the most popular name in Minnesota, for example, Logan, is not even in the top 30 in California or New Jersey. So you have deep differences in naming practices, which I argue can just happen from this, uh, from, from this pattern of drift. Yes? What would happen if the originality of the name itself were uh, the subject of what's being copied? That is, people would copy the yeah, um, in, in that case, uh, I think that could just accelerate the whole process because, um, for example, here, uh, Logan is, here, Logan is pretty common and people might start abandoning that name. But out here, Logan's actually not that common, so Logan could still be on the, could be doing something quite different out in California than from here. So you might have a name falling in one state and rising in the other, especially if, if no novelty was what they liked. Um, but novelty, that's a very good question because um, on the, uh, some, a, a guy at Hewlett Packard has been actually been looking for how we select for novelty online. And I think it just, it, it actually just speeds this process up because if we're all going for novelty, then we're really going to be all, really going to be confused. All right. So um, I think that's the significance of this process, that you can actually evolve over time um, discrete differences between regions through nothing other than this, what is effectively a drift process. Okay, just a couple of things to think about now. Uh, the first thing is um, uh, uh, the subject of a paper that Stefano sent to me uh, last week. Um, I, I, I've told you about different uh, patterns that you expect from the lower right, and I've argued that by and large, baby names conform to the lower right, random copying. But first of all, I showed you a few exceptions to that rule. So if there's high status for somebody, like a president, we often, as a population, just jump to that name and, and it, it, it spikes in popularity just as soon as um, that, the president is elected. Also, from down the road at the Wharton Business School in, um, at University of Pennsylvania, Jonah Berger, who, weirdly enough, when I was in the village two days ago, he walked in. Um, Jonah Berger, in, in my presentation here, I just, I come to a city of 8 million or 12 million people and he walks into the cafe I am, I'm in 25, 15 minutes, so uh, it's strange, a strange uh, small world. Anyway, he published uh, a paper in a, in a prominent journal just a couple of years ago uh, showing, as, um, as actually Stefano and colleagues have, have verified, that actually things are not as stochastic as I showed, not as up and down and wiggly, but actually names tend to come and go in, in much more smooth patterns um, than, than you would expect under the pure random copy. 
And of course that makes sense to me too because we have reasons for selecting names. We're trying to define our generation in opposition to a previous generation. We're directing that copying in some way. Um, we're directing them towards ancestors or kin and so on. So I'm not surprised. So actually it may be that under my scheme, names might be more in the upper right than the, than the lower right. But names are very complicated, very multifaceted. Um, there's a lot of thinking to be done here. So that's one question that I have, um, and I think Stefano is, is uh, working on that one. And then the other is to just think about the pattern that we're engaged here in human history. We, we as a species, come from groups um, as of hunter-gatherers where options were few, and the difference between them was very different, was very obvious. Um, do you go? Do you go forage for honey or do you go hunting for a giraffe? Um, you know, it's not like it's a confusing decision. Um, and we also made decisions in either independently or at least in very small groups. Now we're getting to the situation where um, uh, one in ten people who are online are on Facebook um, and, uh, and we're confronted with an incredible array of similar options. And in a way, the progress of human society has been to bring us down into this corner. And many phenomena that used to be maybe up in that corner or, or up here. Um, we're overwhelmed with choice and we're doing almost everything socially. So much is happening socially. Um, and finally, given that that may be the case, what is the effect of the ubiquitous popularity list? Because if you didn't know if you just looked at this um, at a headline or a story on the internet but did not have the information that this is a popular story or that this is on the top ten most popular list, you're just as likely to pick it as maybe any other. But now we have technology to actually show you exactly how popular everything is at all times. And does that actually um, take things, phenomena that might be down here many different options in a social context, does that actually bring it up there or up here, but over there where it, it, you might actually have a quite a rational decision where I will just do the most popular thing at all times. You don't even have to think, um, but you have all the information. Um, so no, you're no longer copying people around you at, at random as, as, one, as this corner says. You're no longer selecting people based on their attributes to copy, like he's the best hunter, or he's the best Google news reader, so I'll copy him. Um, you're, just, you're just picking the top story, you're just picking the top album, you're just picking the top behavior and doing that. Um, and, and what effect does that have on, uh, on the way that cho choice evolves? And we'll see, because we've never had so many, so, such a wealth of data on human decision making as we have now. And that's the end of my talk. Um, I think it makes, it makes uh, understanding human, mass human behavior much less predictable. So you can't, um, you can't introduce an option to a population which is, which is beneficial for them and expect them to do it if things are down here. You have to, so at the government policy level, um, you have to think about not only is this a good idea for people, but you've actually got to do it. Um, and how, how are we going to make that happen? And so everybody has a good idea um, and the, the, the literature is filled with good ideas that, that never caught on. Um, and that's I think because, and more and more now these days, good ideas never uh, often don't catch on. Um, we just biased to think that good ideas do because we only remember the winners, but for every winner there's lots and lots of failure. Um, so it makes, it makes things fundamentally unpredictable. That's, that would be my answer. Yeah. Whether they should get a checkup or not. You, you gave an example of they saw an ad on the subway and then they, they read it, but then the social pressure made them wrong. 
Yeah, yeah. Even if they said that the social I mean, yeah, it's a, um, I can give you some examples. It's a great oversimplification, but it does help as a rule of thumb for people trying to make decisions on how to approach a problem. Up here in the upper left might be your food choices. So you just, you just don't like liverwurst, so you don't eat it. You like bananas, so you eat them. I have a 16-month-year-old boy, and he likes what he likes, and he doesn't like what he doesn't like. It doesn't matter what we tell him. That's up here. He's just deciding based on his own fixed tastes and preferences, his own sort of cost benefits, what he likes. Up here are things that diffuse because maybe it's a good idea, um, but you have, to under, you have to learn about it socially. So lots of great technologies that diffuse through populations, whether you're talking about agriculture 8,000 years ago or um, uh, genetically modified food crops uh, 50 years ago, or even probably the iPod, uh, the, I, the, uh, the iPhone and iPod. A lot of people said, wow, that's cool. Um, I'll get one of those, but they had to, it had to diffuse, um, and they were copying someone maybe that they knew. Another example up here is girls who get the HPV um, vaccination in Europe. That's um, prevention against future cer cervical cancer. Um, you have to get the vaccination when you're about 14, and the influence of the mother is phenomenal in those cases. If the mother advises the girl to get the vaccination, it's very, it's, it's very effective. So she's not copying randomly whatsoever. She's taking her mother's advice here. Here are just whoa, wearing Crocs, you know, uh, uh, all the new fashions I've seen in Brooklyn that I couldn't do over in England, because I'd love to be able to wear a stocking hat all the time, um, but I can't. Um, you know, you can't really wear hats inside in England, but I was thinking, oh yeah, I'll wear a stocking hat all the time. But lots of things, you see slang words especially, um, uh, you know, casual vocabulary, New, new acronyms that spread online. You don't know where they come from, and and they're not. One is not more valuable than the other. And here, I don't. You know, you don't. See, you don't see this a lot. But but you're doing something independently. You're overwhelmed by choice. So you're just like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'll take that. Um, so me when I bought that that insulated coffee mug um, in Denver at the RAI. So and you can see. You don't have to have me tell you that that how you approach situations, if you confidently map, map them in these different areas, you approach them differently. Vodka, whiskey. Whiskey is much more traditional. We learn our preferences and, and uh, you know, whiskey has prestige to it. And the data actually plot better up here. Vodka, very trendy. Um, new vodka, uh, you know, being served at, at, LA, at the pub. Um, it's all glitzy. They all look the same. Um, they plot it a lot more down. Yeah. Um, well, um, Duncan Watts of Yahoo Networks, he used to be at uh, Columbia, but he just decided to make two million a year at Yahoo um, for some reason. He advocates um, for, for, for movie making, for example, you don't, you don't bet everything on a big blockbuster because there's lots of blockbuster flops that cost hundreds of millions. He said place lots of bets. So if you are in a business where there are, um, and you're producing things where the, where the consumers have a lot of choice already and they're all very similar, like mobile phone cases, cell phone cases, or what have you, then you've got to place a lot of bets. You don't put everything, invest everything into one thing thinking it's going to work. You just make lots of different choices. And um, I've seen actually the marketing campaign of Sony um, doing that. Uh, it, uh, as opposed to Apple, who can count on being better every time they produce something, it's up there. It's just better. They don't have to worry about it. But now, I just read in the paper, there are going to be dozens of new iPod, iPad copies very soon. And then that's going to drift the situation down here. People are going to be, you know, there's less, there's le there's less to, to go on unless you just go with it. Yeah. But I, I, have, I think Apple's a great example because it's... 
you, it's, an, it's an Apple, yeah. or it's every other IBM PC compatible computer. Right, so, right. So, so that's a one-to-one -one choice. Yeah, yeah. And once you're in that other market, then you're back into the Yes, the, yes. The, the, so your advice to IBM compatibles would be down here. Your advice to Apple would be just keep what you do what you're doing. That's where everybody wants to be. Right. You want to be the better mousetrap that everybody knows is a better mousetrap. Well, that's, that's but if you're stuck down here. Ah. The question is, yeah, what do you want to do without being authorized? Uh, we must bring this in the office. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? You just stopped him? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must. That's my All right. Um, can there be a mixture of random copying and then let's say independent, like a decision based on a decision phase, like the HPV, um, uh, yeah. she doesn't quite take her mother's advice, but it is for, it's kind of way probably on a decision later. Yes. Yes. That's what makes this really challenging in practice. So if we're, if we're dealing with some client or something, you know, they, they just want, like, what is it? So what we do sometimes is break it down into different aspects. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe somebody makes uh, uh, t TVs and cameras, and cameras are a bit more up here and TVs are a bit down here or something like that. But, and the other thing is, yes, we know there's a mixture of people. And essentially we're saying the bulk of your market is here. A lot of people like this, even though um, definitely there's some people who get HPV tests for a you know, much different reason. So this is, this is very much a uh, what's sort of like the, the general characteristic of the market doing. Um, and in some sense, if you're operating on that level, you don't care if there are some individual deviations because you just want to move everything in some direction. You want people getting these tests, uh, so for example. But that's also why the close, the, the, the deep social sciences where you go in and do participant observation and ethnography and interviews and stuff fit into this, are integral to this because this is just a general sense from the population. Then you ask people to go in and you say, well, the market data look like this, but can you go in and do some interviews and find out what, it, what is it about this interaction between mother and daughter? You can kind of guess with that one, but um, that, that is actually making it so powerful as it compared to the conversation with the father or with a friend. Um, and you have to do this with, um, so you have to do this with qualitative social science as well. Oh, oh I will. It gets quite uh, gnarly online because there are a lot of different kinds of popularity online. So you do get those, for example, you get those technophile topics like um, electronic equipment or review sites and so on. Um, and, uh, and it's very questionable what people are doing. Are they giving it a good review because other people gave it a good review? Are they just annoyed? Um, so on. You've seen this on TripAdvisor, for example. And essentially the trick there is to just actually take the data from the site, the, the, the popularity data from the site, and try to map it here, even though you know there's, there's deviance, um, deviations from that. And say, again, by and large, this is what's happening. But yeah, it gets, this is why I left it on this slide, because there's so much going on online that's affecting how we make decisions. It's, it's, it's getting a bit much. That's why we looked at baby names for so long, because that really, for most of the 20th century, that was not an online kind of decision.
Ah, yeah. Um, well, um, in some sense, these different states are slightly different cultures, but I know what you're saying. Um, for example, it'd be very... Yes. Or even more, even more different would be um, cultures where actually the, the choice of names is actually quite small because you're just inheriting it through your patriline or your matriline. Um, I actually going to see somebody uh, in Phoenix in a couple of days who has a great data set from a hunter, a pastoralist society in Africa. We're going to look at those names because um, you're absolutely right. We live in a unique time where you can pick your own name. Uh, go before the, the 20th century, virtually no society had that luxury where you could just pick a name for your child. Um, and I've got a great sociology study from East London which shows the percentage of girls and boys who inherited their parents' names and it just goes down and by the 1930s it's gone. But before that, you just inherited, a lot of people just inherited ancestors' names. So that's another thing about all of this is that this is a unique, we are in a unique time where we have this kind of freedom of choice of so many different um, kinds of cultural things. Um, this was never the case uh, before. Uh, what? Um, I had a, um, I worked, I was working with a PhD. One place where we do see this actually is in like pottery design and art and so on. Uh, but something, something, it's curious about names because that actually used to have be invested with a lot of meaning. My colleague at Durham is Icelandic and she just inherits her father's name. She's Vidar's daughter. Um, so she's just given the name of her. Isn't that right, Stefano? In Iceland. Yeah. yeah. You don't have any choice. You are like your father's daughter or your father's son. Yeah. yeah. And that, that was the, the, that's where all the Johnson and Anderson come in, in England. And then in Thailand, Sweden, they, they got yeah. bored, so they started to change their names. What about in Italy? In Italy, it used to be like that until the 1500s. Hmm. Then they started. The, the names crystallized, so you, you could be like uh, John, son of uh, Virginia, Virginia, for instance. <laughs> But then you're uh, at some point your name uh, stuck. So everyone was called with the name of uh, an outdistant ancestor. So, like I, I have uh, uh, my cousin is called Di Giovanni, but he's uh, his father is called Giovanni. You there must have been some distant Giovanni in your family. Yeah. Where those models fit into your box? Oh. Like where, where they kind of, where you kind of got. Yeah. I'd put economists in the upper right, anthropologists in the up. sorry, economists in the upper left, anthropologists and maybe some psychologists in the upper right. Uh, not many people in the lower right and not many people in the lower left. Um, but it, for a long time it's always been, even in anthropology, you can make social decisions but but you're very, you're, you're very closely at, attentive to the status of the person you're copying, which is definitely true in small-scale societies, but it just gets all mixed up when you're in such a big society like this one. But if you're in a small whaling or hunting society, you can, you can determine the status of, of, of that person. So, and sociology, um, I'm, not, I'm trained to not know because <laughs> I'm an anthropologist. Um, we, we have to, to take only just, just two questions because yeah, sorry. we have to go to the airport. So we have to take you and John. I want to set a um, question. Steve Jobs, he, he said once, um, if you create a product and you show people what they need, then they'll, they'll want it. Yeah, they'll beat a path to your door. Right, so yeah. is, is there any such thing as innovation or copying? I mean, is it, I mean, is it 
are we always just copying anyway? And is innovation just physical laws? Because I mean, the, the computer is based on something that came before that. And we yes. Always stand on yes. The shoulders. And what I think you see often is. Sometimes an innovation will be uh, enough of a jump so that it creates a new paradigm, and you'll see it take off um, and, uh, in, in, a, um, in a very determined sense. But then as that's happening, people are copying like what you said, and pretty soon the space of choice is just is saturated again, and you don't know what to choose. So um, uh, anything that Apple has made, for example, or, or go back to... Um, Sony's invention of the Walkman in the 80s. And then pretty soon you had so many different um, you know, personal stereo devices, you couldn't even remember who invented it. So Sony had kind of lost its advantage, and they certainly lost their advantage now. Only old school people remember that. Um, but you see this time and time again. Something good comes along, everybody copies it, and then you're like, well, which one do I choose now? I think that's a, that's a common, it happens certainly in academic uh, fashion. Uh, you know, not many people. I don't. The, the deconstructionism, deconstruction, is not very popular now, um, but it was very popular in the late 70s and 80s. So in a sense, you are but I'm, it's very disquieting some of the things you say as a reflector on academic buzzwords, fashion, authority, and so on. And I'm just curious, then, since I'm taking that and I'm worried about it, I'm publishing a book which is supposed to be the book in a certain field, and I realize my discourse may be far out and all that kind of thing. But uh, what about George Lakoff and all this emphasis on training? Do you have any thought about that? Um, I just read um, Castine and, and Thaler's book, um, and they discussed framing. And just remind me what it is. It's how the relative value of something changes depending on what are the other things are around it. Well, um, yeah, I think, I think what happens in academia is that we all get siloed um, and we start, we, we, get into, we get into positions where we're just sort of in a, in a, in a swirl of different buzzwords. Um, and uh, and, and it's, it, it can be different because, because they're all kind of saying the same thing. It's difficult to choose one for the other. Um, but... Um, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe, say, uh, the, but uh, I, I, there are many ways I could describe a stone tool in archaeology. There are many adjectives, but one of them would not be explosive, because that's you know there's an obvious difference between explosive and you know hardness and and facets and so on. So we get into a situation where there's just this. It's a very small space and it's very densely filled with different options. And we, we continue the, to invent different options, slightly different options within that, um, so, um, uh, because that's what we like to do. We like to make small variations on a theme. So, you know, think about the, whatever you argue is the origins of rock and roll, um, there's, or pop, or a certain pop genre. You can remember a point where it didn't exist, and then when it did, and then a point where there was so much of it, you couldn't tell it apart. Um, most of what I hear now is the latter category because I'm old. Because I'm old. Is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a very yeah, yeah. We can thank. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good. Oh,